Cancelled. The Apple products that never were. Dramatic enough? I'm Ike Dave and I simplify Apple so that everything just works for you and if you want the latest Apple news, leaks and rumours every weekday at 12 UTC, like the video, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell, all those things, and you can join the notification squad. But we're going to get straight into it today. There's been a few news stories out about a few uh, Apple products that were supposed to come out and didn't. So I've gathered a couple of older ones as well uh, that we're going to throw in there and make it into more of a uh, stuff that Apple said they were going to make or tried to make and then didn't. Let's go. First up, Black Ceramic Apple Watch. So this is coming via Mr. White on Twitter. Uh, it's based on the Series 5 design. This was intended originally to come out in 2019 and would have been an edition. Now, interestingly, the edition has a bit of a weird history. So it started off with the first generation Apple Watch where we had those uh, super bling in $10,000 uh, 18 karat, I believe it was, gold-plated Apple Watches, which um, basically were Series 0, so they, they were trash, absolute trash. Uh, however, they looked really cool, and they definitely got the media's attention when they were being worn by celebrities. Now, with Series 2, Apple changed their edition from being gold to being ceramic, which is a bit of a weird change, you know, going from uh, jewellery to plates. I guess, uh, but ceramic is very, very strong, not 18 karat gold premium, but very premium. So a really interesting switch and uh, white has tended to be the ceramics color, but for the Apple Watch Series 5, because there was no Series 4 uh, editions and there have been no Series 6 editions, but for Series 5, we got the white ceramic back and Apple was apparently trialing a black ceramic too, as you can see, never came out though. Don't know why. Apple Doctor. This one's weird. Okay, Project Casper would have brought Apple's own primary care health clinics that make use of the data from your Apple Watch to get a kind of clearer overall picture of a patient's health with long-term trends being more available than had ever been in the past. Apple actually operated a number of clinics in Cupertino as a trial, uh, which is actually still ongoing. Though it appears that the project has lost a number of people, so it's clearly not been a smooth ride. And honestly, the amount of data that comes out through Apple Watch is pretty incredible. Obviously, we're looking at in, in future things like uh, body temperature being measured, I guess, at fairly regular intervals by your Apple Watch and logged by your phone so you can actually see when a fever started. Uh, things like blood glucose monitoring, if they're able to do that optically, which is one of the big... Uh, challenges that they have in front of them rather than having to have anything that pierces the skin that will be a big game changer as well although i don't see it being used for diabetes care it might be something that could help to detect diabetes early before someone goes into a dka which is a, a deep keto acidosis um and that's basically when people tend to end up in hospital before they even know that they have diabetes but the other thing that it could well be used for and this is probably the main use case is actually the kind of athletes performance side of things there is a sensor that you can get called a libra a libra 2 which is what my son uses for his diabetes but they also sell it under i think a brand called like super sapiens or something like that uh, and basically it's the same sensor you in insert it into your arm with a needle on an applicator thing and uh, and then it just leaves like a little filament in your arm that thing lasts for two weeks and uh, and basically can monitor your glucose in real time and you just scan it with your iphone or the little scanner that it comes with it's pretty impressive but i would imagine that the apple watch would be able to do something closer to that where it can be used to see when you get peaks in your blood glucose from uh, food that you've just eaten so uh, athletes would be able to plan better when to eat around training that kind of thing but also for the for the rest of us if apple is bringing in food tracking at some point then it might also give you a good idea of what foods enter your system faster and then cause you to crash and then that's why you feel hungry because your blood sugar has dropped I think that's the kind of thing that will be coming to it. And imagine if, in addition to your heart rate over time, your uh, potentially your EKGs that you can do on your watch, your activity level, your blood glucose, your and your body temperature over time, uh, that's going to give a really clear picture to your doctor of what's been going on with your body. Uh, you know, 
as, as good as you can get really without getting into blood tests and things. So uh, this could be a game changer if it comes to fruition. If not, then all the stuff that Apple is doing with it will probably end up going into some other sort of system that allows regular doctors that aren't necessarily part of Apple's own kind of brand to access your uh, your watch data in a simple way, if you want them to. Next up, Air Power. This is one that everyone's heard of, obviously. So the Air Power was announced with the iPhone X in 2017, uh, alongside the iPhone 8 as well, which was the first one that got the glass back, so it could also have wireless charging, which is handy because Air Power would have allowed users to place wireless charging accessories and iPhones all over the surface wherever you wanted to and it would charge so that's iphones apple watch which uses a different charging standard airpods uh, or anything else that you happen to have with wireless charging built in the issue was that for this to work the mac would basically have to have lots of overlapping charge coils and this caused major issues with heat late prototypes even included an a10 chip which presumably aimed to manage which coils were active at any given time but the project was actually cancelled in March of 2019, just a day after iOS 12.2 was released, which actually had support for air power built into it. There was a lot of rumours around that time about whether it was coming, and then Apple killed it on the website the next day. And last, cellular MacBooks. Now, you might be thinking, we've never had cellular MacBooks, but they might well be on the way. Well, actually, uh, Apple made prototypes way back in 2007 with 3G SIM cards inside and a display-mounted antenna that you could pull up like a little walkie-talkie. It's very, very cute. And the reason that I mention this one as well is because it does look a lot like Apple should, I say should, I'm not saying will, I'm saying should be able to now uh, get on with it and actually make cellular 5G-enabled MacBooks. Uh, and, and the main reason for this is that uh, Apple bought Intel's modem business a few years ago and so far we've still not seen any kind of fruits from that tree that they purchased. Um, I'm not suggesting that modems grow on a tree. I don't know where this uh, analogy is going. But it definitely makes sense to me that Apple would start to create these cellular versions of their MacBooks. They're doing that full redesign at the moment, so if they need to have new windows put through the metal that will allow for this signal to get through more easily, now is the time to design it in there. Those are the cancelled Apple products that I found most interesting. From the information we had today, as well as a couple of others that were knocking around in my brain space, so uh, which of these do you think would be the most interesting? And if you know of any other cancelled Apple projects, I think these are quite interesting, so hit me up down in the comments. And next up, we have some IK answers for you. Uh, these are questions submitted by the community down in the comment section. All you do, use hashtag IK answers, and I will answer them down there. Although this first one didn't use the hashtag, um, but I'm ask answering it here anyway because it's quite involved, and I think it covers quite a lot of stuff for the audience in general. But this comes from Naveen Magapu. They ask, can someone please explain the performance differences between the M1 chip in iPad Pro, A14 Bionic in the iPad Air, and also the supposed M1X and or M2 chips predicted for the 14-inch and 16-inch MacBooks? Am I right to assume the A-series will continue like A14, A15, etc. in the iPhone and the mini iPad ranges, and the M-series chips are the most powerful ones to be continued as M1X, M2, M3, etc. in the MacBook and iMac ranges? Is the M1X and M2 both going to come out simultaneously with a redesigned Air and uh, MacBook Pro? So, some great questions there. Um, I'll hit the the last part first that we will be getting the m1x as well before we get the m2s uh but that that time period is getting closer because i think m2 is coming in october and i think that we will probably have to get m1x very very soon so probably next month uh i'm still going to keep on with the date that i have heard is coming this is not confirmed this is not a leak as far as i know but july the 20th um that's when we're hoping to see the macbook pros right to the rest of your question, um, in terms of performance differences, so the A14 is the one that goes into the iPhone, uh, the iPhone 12 range, and also the iPad Air at the moment. Um, that has uh, four efficiency cores, two performance cores, and a four-core GPU. Um, I believe it's the same in the Air, 
but the Air does perform better on graphics, so there might be some differences under the hood there that I'm not aware of. But that's the kind of base chip. That is the super power efficient one. Geekbench scores on this are about 1700 on single core and about 4200 for the multi core score. Now, when we move up to the iPad Pro, that's got the M1 in it now, which is basically what A14X would have been. Um, it has got extra components added to it, so it's got things like the hypervisor for Macs. It's got things like far more RAM uh, possibilities, so you can now spec it up to 16 gigs based on the storage configurations that you do. Uh, but in terms of the performance, in terms of performance, you are looking at getting... Uh, about 1700 again because the cores are exactly the same as the ones in the iPad Air and but you've got uh, exactly the same number of efficiency cores but double the number of performance cores so you're going up from two performance cores to four performance cores which gives you a multi-core score of about 7500. Then moving up to the, we're getting into theoretical stuff now, the M1X is the most likely to come out next, we're expecting that to have uh, a 10 core uh, processor which is going to be two efficiency cores with eight performance cores that is expected to hit around about 13,500 to 14,000 on Geekbench 5 which is compared to the 7400 ish on the previous uh, M1 model and then that's also going to have access to more GPU cores so while the M1 has eight this will have 16 or 32 is what we're being told and then when we're getting up into the real theoretical stuff we're going to m2 that's probably going to launch around about october time that we think is still going to have the same layout of cores as the m1 so it's going to have four uh four efficiency cores and four performance cores but each core is going to be faster by between 20 and 25 percent is most likely and uh, so that's where the performance benefit there comes now, there's possibilities that they might change the way that those cores are laid out. We suggested maybe a, a 6 and 2 layout with 6 performance cores yesterday, but we don't know how much of the uh, efficiency cores are being hit by these computers. So, don't take my word for that one. Uh, so, yeah, the M2s are going to be somewhere around 25% faster, assuming they keep the same core layout. If they change it to uh, 2 and 6, we're probably going to be getting somewhere around 50% faster because you've got 50% more of those performance cores. So hopefully that answers your question on what's what and uh, what kind of layouts we have for the different things. We've talked about it before, but it has been a little while, so hopefully that clears things up. Okay, for some reason I can't find out who uh, asked this question, so I'm really sorry for not giving you a shout out by name. If I can find it, I will put it on the screen. Okay, the answers. Is Apple keeping users from expanding RAM in their systems with the M-series chips their way of lowering the useful lifespan of a system and thus ensuring that users buy new machines once the system starts to endure a memory bottleneck? I don't think this is the case at all uh, and I've, I've talked about why in the past. Apple is looking to get as many people using their systems as possible. Apple provides five to seven years of uh, operating system updates. Um, with most of these normally around about seven years so they don't want the system to stop working while they're still supporting it and giving it new features and still giving it security updates and stuff they want people to be using them now now there is a case to be made that limiting the uh, upgradability of memory and things does limit the life of a system for particular users but only to the same extent that uh, upgrading the cameras on an iphone um, limits their useful life to some users as well. There are a lot of people out there that are still very happy to use an iPhone uh, SE, the original one. It still gets the current operating system, it gets the current uh, software and still will next year with iOS 15. There's not a great deal of stuff that it can do that's new with iOS 15, but it will get the new look and the new layout and it will work better probably. Apple doesn't limit its systems to try and make you buy another one. They want you to keep using them because the longer you use their systems and the more useful life that people can get out of them, the more they will make in revenue for things like services. So that, as everyone has seen over the past year or so, or probably three or four years, Apple has really refocused a lot of their efforts on services because it's one of the things that, A, if you've got multiple devices, it makes them all work better together. So things like iCloud, being able to sync between uh, your different devices, uh, things like uh, Apple Arcade, where you can play a game on 
uh, your Mac and then pick it up on your phone later and then pick it up in your iPad or play it on your TV with an Xbox controller. Um, I don't think there's very many people that are bumping into this memory bottleneck that you talk about, even though you can only get up to 16 gigs of memory on an M1 at this, at this point. Uh, the swap that you can do with SSD is so fast that it doesn't really make too much difference. And we will be talking about swap in a bit because someone else has asked a question about uh, swap file usage, which I thought we'd have finally got rid of. But there we go. We're coming back to it. But no, Apple wants these systems to be used for years and years. And I actually think if anything, these ones will last as well as anything else that Apple's put out. The 2012 MacBook Pros still in use by people. Um... And yes, they were more upgradable at the time, but they're still a nearly decade old computer that people might have put slightly faster storage in to kind of keep up with what we have now and a little bit more RAM. But it's still, in general, going to be the very old processor, so it isn't going to be a fast system. Because Apple has optimized their software quite well, then it still works well. With a lot of these Macs, once they are done with, with the initial buyer, the person that bought them because of the speed that they had, when they upgrade to something else, they'll sell them on and they'll still be used. And they'll probably have another couple of owners before the end of their life. I will probably get the next Mac Mini when it comes out, replace this one, sell this one on, or keep it as a backup machine for running betas and stuff like that. But either way, the vast majority of people that use a computer don't use it for high-end video editing or playing high-end games. The vast majority of people that own a computer use it to do emails, surfing the internet, maybe writing some documents. That's pretty much what people use their computers for. So even though it might not be fast enough for you, might not have enough memory for you, it's, uh, it's still a very capable computer. Alan B Unboxings and News asks, iCave Answers, did you know that Apple put on their Apple Worldwide Developers Conference that they put in tags that are M1X 14-inch MacBook Pro, M1X 16-inch MacBook Pro, M1X 17-inch MacBook Pro, and the last tag that they put M1X. So yes, Apple did include M1X uh, tags in their um, in their YouTube stream for the WWDC. Um, they didn't include all of those MacBooks. They included M1X MacBook Pro and M1X. That was all that they did. It's, it's on the screen here. You can see it. I've grabbed these today. And yeah, uh, we, we've already talked about this on the channel. Uh, it looks like they were probably intending to release MacBook Pros at the event, but I'm guessing there were some delays, which is why I don't think they're going to be that much longer. This, this is why I think uh, July is probably a decent bet. End of July and then uh, shipping to people early August, week 31. I believe it is, of the year. So that's when I think they're coming. Bruce Grubb asks, IK Vances, the Mac Rumor forums have two threads on excessive SSD wear on the M1 Max. One example seems to be a bank that used M1s as a Postgres server, four months old, 2% spare, 10% thresh, 98% used, 600 terabytes write, 500 terabytes read, 200 hours on, 10,000 media and data integrity errors on a 512 gig drive and someone else presented 33% of drive life used and 338 terabytes written to the disk in approximately a thousand hours of runtime. They're quick to blame Apple but I suspect things like people having running way too many programs for the amount of RAM that they've got, running badly written slash ported programs that love right into the hard drive, not having enough a big enough hard drive for what they need to do or like that bank using the M1 in a way that it, that it was never designed for. What are your thoughts of these examples of high SSD usage? Well, I'm glad that you pointed out that these are not kind of typical use cases for starters. So the bank is probably using some legacy software that has probably been ported over and is probably running through Rosetta. Rosetta is something that will use a bit more swap because it needs to basically do a lot of translation on the fly. So not only is the, uh, the program itself running, but also the translation and uh, stuff like that which will need to use more RAM. Even if these are complete outliers and there's only a couple of them, there will be software out there that is poorly optimized. Things like, I don't know, Chrome. Um, so Chrome, when you are just watching YouTube videos, is writing an excessive amount of stuff to the disk because it seems to be trying to buffer a lot of those YouTube videos. However, when you use Safari, you use far, far less of that. It uses less uh, memory in the first place. It uses less RAM for each tab. 
there are certainly some resource hogs there and I would guess that these, uh, especially a bank computer is probably accessing the internet quite a lot or accessing networks quite a lot, grabbing a lot of data and then sending more out and using dynamic. It's probably going to be that it's using a huge amount more. It's probably a setup that could really use uh, a lot more RAM than it has. And yet it's not a typical use case, but also let's bear in mind that if a bank is using this to do its um, its server work, even if it lasts a couple of years and it's only cost, let's say $600, that's a very good deal for a bank to have a server for $600 for two years, $300 a year for a server is not bad going. Um, however, I would expect that the in general, the SSDs are going to massively outlast what the rated life is for them and nobody actually knows what the rated life is because we don't appear to have those ratings now when it says 33 percent ssd usage that is based on uh, on the typical figures of the typical amount of data that can be written to an ssd apple uses very good quality ssds and they also uh, bought a company called iobit i believe was the name of the company who are literally specialists in making uh, SSDs last longer and they've always used swap apparently they've not used as much as now I think Rosetta is probably the biggest thing to blame for some of this but it comes down to developers to actually update their apps in a timely way so that you're not having to use Rosetta not really Apple's issue I don't think although they have done some fixes that have reduced the SSD usage as well Team Kinetics asks IK okay, answers, what's your video production setup slash workflow? What do you use to film and edit for the channel? And do you have any kit in your wish list to make life easier? So it's actually quite simple. We did do a video a little bit like this. I think it was more of a day in the life of, but in terms of the uh, the kind of hardware and software that I use, uh, so it's the uh, Fifine uh, microphone that's just down here. So that's the audio taken care of. That is just a USB microphone that is plugged directly into the uh, Mac Mini. And just up here, there is um, a record directly into QuickTime on the Mac. And then that is saved as a separate file. The video is recorded on iPhone 12 Pro Mac using an app called Filmic Pro. And then I also use my iPad Air down here which controls everything that's going on. But the iPad gives me all of the controls that I would have on the screen of the iPhone, so it makes it very, very easy. I can monitor audio levels if I was recording directly audio into the iPhone as well, which I used to do. And you can also make sure that it's in focus, which it might not have been for the rest of this video because the uh, the reticules were in the wrong place, I've just noticed. But this uh, video file then basically gets saved onto the iPhone, gets airdropped over to the Mac Mini, and then the editing is all done in Final Cut Pro, which I've just always found is super easy I import the two bits the audio file and the video file I always do a sync clap at the beginning which I can then use that spike to align the two files then I do my color correction on the video cut out the audio from the video and just keep the audio from the external recorder and uh, and then combine those two clips into a single composite clip that basically means that I haven't got to mess around with keeping the audio in sync once it's done it's done then one of the other things that I do here which is a little bit different to most people is I don't let Final Cut render in the background um, Final Cut will export videos insanely quickly if you leave background rendering on. Uh, and you can certainly do that, and it is effective. It works really well. My issue is, because I've got the base storage model, so I've got the 256 gig SSD on this one, it fills up very, very quickly if you have the background rendering on because it's making proxy files, it's making stuff ready, and it keeps all of that stuff in your library file. So I've turned all that off. I keep the actual library file on an external drive, which is this SSD here which is another 256 and basically that then means if I had a problem with my uh, system I can plug that into my old iMac and carry on editing as long as I can get the files straight back from the uh, iPhone which I can just airdrop to the iMac so it gives me my backup really of, uh, of all the projects. I think that's kind of it. Uh, I then just export it from there at 1080p, upload it to YouTube uh, all of my script is done in notes, which then becomes my show notes as well for the show, which just gets pasted into YouTube. And then I use Photoshop to make the thumbnails. So that's what I do. But I've just found that the camera on the iPhone is far more reliable than using an actual camera. 
and gives me a better image. It's just better. It's just a lot better. Better focus, all that stuff. I am working though on filming directly with the iPhone in the native app so I get the HDR and then using the other display that I have over here which is uh, I just need to work out how to connect it to that one. Um, that's that's going to be hopefully what I do in future because the problem is when I've done the iPhone video directly without the remote app I sometimes haven't got it even recording and I can't tell that because it's facing the wrong way so I can use the right camera and that's very disappointing. Anyway guys, that's it for this video. If you found it interesting, smash like, subscribe to the channel, ring the bell so you can join the notification squad and post up hashtag notification squad in the comments and you'll get a shout out. Thanks ever so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.